these men very highly in love for their for their work sake. Incidentally, what was the first hymn that we sang today? How many remember? Well, that's not too bad. <laughs> this afternoon, I would like to speak to you about seven principles of the New Testament church. For many of you, this will be nothing new at all. Perhaps for some of the younger people, it might be helpful. Seven principles of the New Testament church, and these certainly don't exhaust the principles either. I'll go over them first of all, and then we'll just, uh, I'll list them first of all, and then we'll go over them step by step. Principle number one, the truth of the one body, has been already alluded to in the ministry. There is one body. Principle number two, all believers are members of that one body. That also has been alluded to. Principle number three, the plurality of elders in the local assembly. The plurality of elders in the local assembly. Number four, Christ, the gathering center of his people. Am I going too fast for you? Use your best shorthand. Christ, the gathering center of his people. Principle number five. The gifts were given for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry. A truly revolutionary insight. The gifts were given as we'll see in Ephesians 4, for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry. Principle number six, every local church autonomous, responsible directly to the Lord alone. Every local church autonomous. And principle number seven, the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. It's good to have convictions about the truth of the Word of God. A lot of us drift through life hanging on to our parents' convictions. We've never really made them our own. We've never hammered them out on our own anvil. I'd like to challenge you today, if you don't have convictions about the New Testament assembly, Go to the Word of God. Ask God to show you personally what the truth is. I'll never forget years ago, dear brother Mace took me aside and he said, Bill, when you get divine principles, stick to them. And you know that's a needed word for the day in which we live. When you get divine principles, stick to them. Well, here are some principles that I believe to be divine. First of all, the truth of the one body. There is one body. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. And this is really a marvelous truth. And it's a precious truth. Although everything in the religious world seems to deny it today. As you look about you in the world today, it seems that the body is decimated. But the truth is there just the same. The truth of God, there is one body and only one body. Lord, keep me from sectarianism. Keep me from a sectarian heart. You know, I believe sectarianism is native in the fallen human heart. I really do. And you and I have to battle it all the time. And we have to stand for this truth in our actions as well as in our hearts the truth of the one body. What are you? People come to me all the time. What are you? And I say, I'm a Christian. They say, of course you're a Christian. You're saved. Everyone who's saved is a Christian. You've got to be something else. Well, I say, I'm a saint. Well, they say all true believers are saints. But, well, what else are you? Well, I'm a disciple of the Lord. Oh, well, they say. Now, quit emphasizing the obvious. You see, they're trying to get me in a pigeonhole. 
And when I refuse to be pigeonholed, they say to me, I know you're a brethren. And there's a look of triumph in their eyes. And I say, I'm a brethren in the same way you're a brethren if you're a born-again believer. I utterly and absolutely refuse such a name as Plymouth Brethren. In fact, I chuckle every time I hear it. Plymouth Brethren. It's a self-contradictory expression. It's like Roman Catholic. Catholic means universal and Roman means not universal. (laughs) Roman means Italian. And um, uh, Plymouth Brethren. Well, Brethren, that's a nice universal term. And then you go and put Plymouth in front of it and spoil the whole thing. And I refuse it. And I refuse the term Christian Brethren, which is spreading in some... I don't want to be anything but a member of the body of Christ. And I rejoice in the body of Christ today. It's thrilling to me. Now, having said that, let me say something. I could look around in the evangelical world, and really there's an awful lot that makes my heart heavy. I've met some of the promoters like Tozer said. He said, I've met the promoters. I've met the comics. I've met the gadgeteers. Because I've met the man, the founder who puts a brass plaque on the building to let people know he's the founder. He said, I've met them all. But he said, my my sympathies are with God's saints, with the humble people of God who are going on quietly for him. Well, I could think of that. I I think I know enough about the evangelical scene today to know it's a bad scene. Really. And the more you know about it, the more disappointed and disillusioned you can get up at the upper echelon. But listen, dear friends, I'm a part of that. And my responsibility is not to look down my theological nose at all. Look, it's all part of the body. And my responsibility is to come before God and confess it all as my sin. Just as we heard last night that Daniel did. Daniel ate the sin offering. If you read some of those things he confessed in Daniel chapter 9, he never did some of those things. But he took those sins, the sins of the nation, and he made them his own. And he bore them up before God as if they were his own sins. And God ended the Babylonian captivity. And I believe that's what God is waiting for us, to have a new vision of the body of Christ. Uh, Not just our own little fellowship, as it were, but to take the body of Christ and say, look, I'm a part of that. It is the body of Christ. And to confess our gross materialism, confess our gadgeteering, confess our pleasure-loving, Confess our broken homes and broken families and broken lives. Bear it all before him in prayer. I believe that. The Lord deliver us from sectarianism. People say, we had a lovely time on our vacation. We, there were some Baptist Christians there, but it's so nice to be back with the Lord's people. <laughs> what do they mean by that? What do they mean by that? It's so nice to be back with the Lord's people. Listen, dear friends, everyone who has the grand mark of redemption upon him is the Lord. And we're all a part of that same bundle of life. So it isn't enough just for me to stand here and profess the truth of the one body of Christ. I have to practice it in my everyday life. I have to give witness to it by all my actions that I belong to that body. I take my place for that body. I confess the sins of that body as my own. The truth of the one body. Beautiful. The second truth is that all true believers are members of the body of Christ. We had that this morning, didn't we, in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body. You know, this is a beautiful thing. We, I think we gloss over these truths sometimes and we fail to realize how wonderful it is. I think I can see in some measure how the church is a witness to principalities and powers, 
of the manifold wisdom of God. I'll tell you, it's wonderful. It's wonderful how God can take a Saul of Tarsus and a Mary Magdalene and a Charles Colson and an Eldridge Cleaver and I believe a Jimmy Carter and a Bill McDonald and make them all members of the body of Christ to the praise of his glory. Isn't that wonderful? And you can put your name in there too if you love them. It's a wonderful thing that he could, that God could go down the person of his son to Death Valley where we were. And I'll tell you, he had pretty poor raw materials to work with. <laughs> pretty poor raw materials to work with. And yet he takes that that clay and he fashions a vessel of glory for his name. Let me ask you something this afternoon. Do you love God's people? In the widest possible sense of the word. I have never yet met a Christian that I couldn't learn something from. I have never yet met a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that couldn't teach me something, and I never expect to either. And I love Christian people wherever I meet them. Now, that doesn't mean I can do everything that they do. I can't. That doesn't mean I agree with them in everything. I, can, I don't. But I tell you, it means this, that I can draw a very narrow circle of truth around myself and have a very wide heart of love for everyone who's a member of the body of Christ. I was in a meeting just this last week and somebody said to me, uh, in fact, it was fuller than last Sunday, somebody said, what about the Pentecostal? I never met a Pentecostal yet. I couldn't learn something from them. I don't agree with it. Either. But I'm telling you, they teach me something. Fervency in prayer. Uh, the simplicity that's in Christ, many of them. And in many of their fellowships, you can go in not arrayed in peck and peck clothes and feel quite at home. They reach the common folk. And these things speak to my heart. I don't agree with them. But I love them. Because they belong to Christ. And I think sometimes that we can react Christians we don't agree with by acts of unlove that are worse than the things they hold. The truth that all true believers are members of the body of Christ. And how wonderful we're going to spend eternity with them. I guess the Lord really first brought this home to me in a very real and practical way during the war years, you know. I tell you, you get out in some of those places and you meet somebody who loves the Lord Jesus and speaks enthusiastically about him. I tell you, the bridges are, are, are already there. And my, the warm fellowship you can have just around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a precious truth it is. Well, I see another great principle in the Word of God, and to me a very important one, and that is this. I think of it as a plurality of elders. I see in the Word of God that God has ordained that in the local fellowship there should be a group of elders. Now, there are many verses we could turn to in this regard. I'd like you to notice Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. This has been a... It's interesting how the Lord uses a seemingly obscure verse like this in a person's life. But he used this one in my life. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Now, here's Paul, a Christian gentleman, and he's writing a letter to the fellowship, to the assembly there in Philippi, and he addresses it to the saints, with the bishops, the elders, and the deacons. Now, that's very significant to me. There's, I see three, I don't want to use the word classes, three groups there. The saints, the bishops are elders, and the deacons. Now, if there had been a one-man minister in that church in Philippi, wouldn't you think that Paul, a Christian gentleman, would have acknowledged him? Why didn't he mention him 
in this first part of his epistle. The reason he mentioned him is because such a man didn't exist. So it wasn't any. But I don't have to labor the point because if you go to the Christian libraries and take down commentaries written by clergymen, written by one, they'll all acknowledge the truth of it. We don't have to fight that battle here this afternoon. Uh, I could turn to commentary after commentary. They say, look, this one man ministry, this clerical system was a development that came in the second century of the church's history. It didn't exist in the primitive church. They agree with that themselves. So why... Why should we labor the point? But it really is an important point just the same. And you know, God's principles work all over the world. They work in every culture, in every land, on every continent. I'll never forget the joy it was for me to go to some of those places like some of the mountains of Italy and um, be there really in the strongholds of darkness in some of these mountain villages and yet meet with a company of believers and uh, they, there were the saints there and there were the bishops the elders and there were the deacons and they were carrying on they didn't have a church building as we speak of it today and they didn't have a one man minister but I tell you it was a joy to talk with those elders to find men who knew their Bibles who were carrying on a shepherd ministry among the people of God and then you go all around the world, you find the same thing everywhere. Fellow, fellowships of believers never heard of us. We never heard of them too, either. But uh, there they are. I tell you, the principles really work. And it's beautiful when you see them working. And this is a very important principle, the, the plurality of elders. Why plurality of elders? Well, I, I tell you, when you think of the day in which we live, when you think of the counseling problems, when you think of the heartache and the difficulty, well, certainly is too much for one man, isn't it? And God in his wisdom has seen to it that there should be a body of men to share the shepherd problems of the sheep of Christ. And I'd like to suggest to you today that the work of the elder is one of the most important works in the world today. I think I set up at Camp Elam when we were there that, that in the estimation of God. The work of an elder is far more important than to be president of the United States. It's far more important. Uh, which means that we as believers in the Lord Jesus should really be praying for our elders. Many of them are facing problems that, humanly speaking, are enough to drive them into the grave. And they deserve the prayers and the fellowship and the support of God's people. Elders that are really there in the thick of the battle. Elders that are willing to be wakened out of bed at any time of the morning, the early morning, to be with the people of God in their problems and in their difficulties. Elders who really are shepherding the sheep, the plurality of elders. But that isn't all. There are other principles that we want to think of today. And I think one of the important ones that I'd like to mention to you is this principle... Um, that the gifts are uh, no, Christ is the gathering center of his people where two or three are gathered together in my name there am I in the midst of them Christ the gathering center of his people this means a lot to me and I'll tell you how it comes to me we don't gather to a man we gather to the Lord Jesus Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. We see so much, especially out where I live, where you get a gifted man of God, uh, a good preacher, and uh, he stands there. Sometimes he as a congregation comes in at 9 o'clock, he preaches a sermon to them. They come in 10.30, he preaches the same message, and they come in a little later again. Another congregation, and he preaches to them. And uh, I don't think it's exaggerating to say that these people are gathered to a man. But that's a great weakness, what happens when the man leaves. In fact, I said that to a dear brother, it broke a beautiful friendship. He said to me, I wouldn't dare leave, he said, if I left the congregation would drop in half. I said to him, to whom are they gathered? Are we really gathering to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? When I come to the meetings of the local assembly, I'm just a, a simple believer. But I believe when we come to the meetings of the, Lord, of the local assembly, the Lord Jesus is there. 
I really believe that. You say, well, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. Well, that's true. He's omnipresent. But I believe his presence is promised in a special way when two or three are gathered together in his name. I believe that. His presence is promised in a special way. And there are times when we gather together like that when he makes special visitations to his people. Have you ever been in a meeting like that? Have you ever been in a meeting where the Spirit of God was moving in a particular way and hearts were bowed and influenced under the moving of the Spirit of God when heaven was very, very near? Well, I know that many of us have been in circumstances like that and uh, we wouldn't have missed it. We didn't know when we went to the meeting how manifest the Lord Jesus would be in the presence of of his assembled people. But that's how he was there. I think of a meeting years ago that I attended in the Lombard area in Illinois. And nobody who's ever at that meeting will ever forget it. If you were to go to Chicago area today and say to some of the Christians there, um, what meeting stands out in your mind above any meeting you ever attended? They'd say, well, it would be that meeting, that missionary study class at the Lombard Fellowship there. When the Lord really drew very near to his gathered people, when there was quiet weeping all over the audience, a special moving of the Holy Spirit of God. A few months later, I got a letter from a dear young brother whom I had known very well. And he said to me, my life has never been the same since the missionary study class. Oh, the bitter, bitter regret, he said. But maybe the Lord can still salvage something from my life for his glory. And it wasn't very long after that that he and his family packed their bags and they were on their way to Brazil to serve the Lord down there. So I say there are times that are special. I believe the Lord Jesus is there every time we gather in his name. But in addition to that, there are times of special visitation. And uh, he's there. And he's very, very real. They tell me about a time years ago back in Philadelphia at a worship meeting. I think Brother McCandless was there at the time. And uh, once again, the hearts of God's people were strangely moved in that time of worship. Jesus was in the midst in a special way and it came time to break the bread and Mr. McCandless went up to the table and he fell down on his knees. And he just poured out his heart in loving adoration to the Lord Jesus. Once again, nobody who was ever at that meeting who was at that meeting will ever forget that. Christ the gathering center of the people. We don't gather. We don't gather to a, a group of loving, hospitable people. Mind you, we ought to be loving, and we ought to be hospitable. But that isn't the gathering center of God's people. The saints aren't the gathering center, no matter how nice they are. No, no. The Lord Jesus is the attraction. And I really believe where you get a group of saints who see this truth and who act upon it, you'll have a stable fellowship. You won't have a group of religious gypsies fluttering from one flower to another. You'll have people who know why they're there and they'll go on with the Lord through thick and thin. Christ, the gathering center of his feet. The next principle I'd like to think about is in Ephesians chapter 4, the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and this one means uh, a great deal to me and I'll tell you why. But first of all, let me read Ephesians chapter 4, um, and I'll begin reading in verse 7, Ephesians 4 and 7, uh, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. 
And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry, unto the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Now many years ago, the Lord had dealings in my heart, and um, I had to come to the place where I had to decide what in the way of church order was going to be for me. I was in Hawaii at the time, and I got before the Lord, and I said, Lord, I believe that if I follow the man bearing the picture of water, you'll show me. I believe the man bearing the picture of water is a picture of the Holy Spirit, type of the Holy Spirit. And I said, what my father believes will no longer do for me. I really have to know myself from the Word of God what it's all about. And the Lord, I believe, directed me to this passage of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, and especially verse 12. Now this passage of Scripture describes some special service gifts that God has given I call them special service gifts. Not everybody is one of these gifts. Not everybody. They're special service gifts. And there are five of them mentioned here. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Apostles and prophets. I agree with Brother Bram all that these were foundational gifts. It says that. It says that in Ephesians chapter 2.20, doesn't it? It says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now that verse says to me that the apostles and the prophets, New Testament prophets, were concerned with the foundation of the church. They are not the foundation of the church. God helped the church that founded on them. They were men with feet of iron and clay like ourselves. The church isn't built on the apostles and prophets, but it is built on what they taught concerning the Lord Jesus built upon the ministry of the apostles and prophets, for instance, Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock I will build my church. The truth, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And so I believe that the apostles and prophets were concerned with the foundation of the church, with laying the foundation of the church, and what they taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. You only lay the foundation how many times? One. Once the foundation is laid, you go and build upon it, and Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So the foundation has, has been laid by the apostles and prophets. I don't believe the apostles and prophets are any with, with us any longer, although their ministry is with us in the pages of the New Testament. So we're not the poorer without the apostles and prophets because we have their ministry preserved for us in the sacred scriptures. But that leaves us with three evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Once the foundation is laid, you go and build upon it, and Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So the foundation has, has been laid by the apostles and prophets. I don't believe the apostles and prophets are, are any with, with us any longer, although their ministry is with us in the pages of the New Testament. So we're not the poorer without the apostles and prophets because we have their ministry preserved for us in the sacred scriptures. But that leaves us with three, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And my own personal view is that these men are itinerant men, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I don't equate the pastors here with the elders in an assembly. I equate them with men like uh, Timothy and Titus who were sent by Paul to do temporary work in various assemblies. Timothy to Ephesus, Titus to Crete, etc. Well, you have the evangelists, first of all. These men, their sphere, their parish is the world. Not the church, the world. And they go out into the world and they preach the gospel of redeeming grace and they see people saved and they see them gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus as a local New Testament fellowship. 
The pastors, I believe these are men who on an itinerant basis carry on a pastoral ministry among the people of God. My mind goes back today to dear brother Harold Harper. I believe in the truest sense of the word he fitted that description. And then you have the teachers and these are men who take the word of God and break it down fine and apply it to the hearts of people. But, but the problem is, the point is this, why did God give these gifts? Why did he give them? The next verse is the crucial key. It says, for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry unto the edifying of the body of Christ. Translation is clearer in some of the more modern versions of the Bible because the punctuation is different. These commas really throw you off the track. The commas part there is not inspired. The commas, of course. For the perfecting of the saints, comma, it says, for the... Uh, for the perfect of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. No, that's not it. It says, for the perfect of the saints, unto the work of the ministry. Who's to do the work of the ministry? The saints are to do the work of the ministry, of service. Which means that these gifts are expendable. Which means that success in this Christian work is working yourself out of a job in the, in the quickest possible time and moving on to new worlds to conquer. Now, this isn't working today very well with the clerical system. As long as we have a clerical system in the world, the body of Christ will never be developed the way God intended it to be, and the world will never be evangelized the way God intended it to be as long as we have that system. God's way is best. And God's way is for these gifts to seek to build up the saints for the work of the ministry and to pass on. The longest the Apostle Paul ever stayed in one place was two years in Ephesus. During his lifetime, he spent a total of three years in Ephesus. But at any one time, the longest he ever stayed was two years. Mind you, he did better than that in Thessalonica, didn't he? He went in there and he preached to the Jews for three Sabbath days and left behind a functioning New Testament church. I'm amazed every time I read it. I think that probably was exceptional, don't you? Probably wasn't the norm, but it worked anyway. And that was success. That was really success in Christian work. Paul didn't think that the saints should be perpetually dependent upon him. He was just thrilled to see them stand on their own feet and moving out for the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you here today know T.B. Gilbert, knew him before the Lord took him up. Really a valuable trooper for the Lord Jesus. And uh, used of God to see works planted in different parts of the United States. Some years ago he went to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And he got on the radio and he started blasting away with the gospel and people got saved and a little testimony was planted there. And he let, them, he let them know right from the outset that he was not a permanent fixture there. One of these days they were going to be on their own. Well, do you know the day came when those dear brethren in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, said, Brother Gilbert, they said, um, we certainly appreciate the work you've done here. We appreciate what you've meant to us. How you've been willing to come down here and meet with us in a storefront and get this work going. And they said, uh, now, they said, you know, there's a little group of exercise believers in Huntsville, Alabama, and we wonder if you'd be uh, interested to, to go over there and see if you could help them. You know, a lot of people would be crestfallen. They'd really be hurt and go in the corner and sulk. He didn't sulk. He said, praise the Lord. And he moved on to Huntsville, and there's a little group of believers there, and the Lord took him home from Huntsville. This is beautiful. And this is the way that God intends that the work should be spread. The gifts were given for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry, unto the edifying of the body of Christ. And this is to, to go on, this process is to go on, to spread by multiplication. You have, of course, the same principle in another way. In Paul writing to Timothy, he said, The things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Well, the Lord showed me this from the Word of God, and it really has had a tremendous influence in my life. I said, yes, this is ideal. And I look around and I see brethren who, uh, many churches, 
evangelical churches would be thrilled to have them, thrilled to have them come. And they could go there and build a work around themselves. God forbid. God forbid. Far better to be used of God to build up saints so that the saints can move out with the gospel of grace and with the teaching uh, of the word of God. Now we believe in addition to that that every church should be autonomous. And I must go fast now. I believe every church, every local fellowship should be an autonomous fellowship. And just one verse to suggest it. And once again, it's interesting how we're repeating passages. But in Revelation chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13, Revelation 1 verses 12 and 13, John says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, we don't have to guess at the golden lampstands. The golden lampstands represent the seven churches of Asia. The Lord Jesus is standing in the midst of the seven churches. What's between him and the churches? Absolutely nothing. There's nothing in the way of a denominational uh, headquarters there, is there? Nothing. Those churches stand directly responsible to the Lord Jesus himself. Admire the wisdom of God. What a wonderful thing. Think of countries today where the Christian church is being oppressed and persecuted. Uh, if the government can seize a denominational headquarters, why, it's very easy to control the, the whole thing. But when every assembly is an autonomous assembly, ah, it's not so easy. Very easy for those assemblies to go underground, as they have had to do in many nations of the world today. And then also, as we've already heard in the conference, uh, the autonomy of the local fellowship hinders the spread of liberalism and modernism in the church. If the liberals and the modernists can seize the headquarters and seize the, the seminary, they can, from then on, it's just a timeless struggle, they can eventually control the whole system. And frankly, they don't care whether there are a few good gospel preaching evangelicals in some of the works in the meantime. It's like communism. It is a timeless struggle. And they figure, well, in time, we'll have the whole thing. Now, that's exactly what happened. I think of the universalist denomination back in New England. If you take their statistics, they're pathetic as a denomination. You, know, you probably never heard of them out here in enlightened Colorado. But they're back there anyway in New England area. And, uh, and their strategy has been to infiltrate, for instance, the divinity school at Harvard and the, the seminaries back there, to infiltrate them and to sow their insidious doctrines in those seminaries. And so they have men today who are preaching in many different denominational pulpits and the people don't know the difference. Don't know the difference. No, no. God's will is that the local fellowship be autonomous and be responsible to him alone. And then just finally, before I close, the last principle that I see in the word of God is the priesthood of all believers. And this too is very, very precious to me. First Peter chapter 2, familiar verses to us. 1 Peter chapter 2, um, verse 4, first of all. 1 Peter 2, verse 4, To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are holy priests. We are royal priests. All believers are. The Old Testament, in order to be a priest, under the Mosaic system, you had to be of the tribe of Levi and of the family of Aaron. That was the way of approach to God. Praise God, God has changed it all in our dispensation, and we are all holy priests. What is our function as holy priests? Well, it says right here in this verse, verse 5, to offer up spiritual sacrifice, not dead animals, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. What are our spiritual sacrifices? Well, there's quite a few of them. We offer up the sacrifice of our praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, our highest privilege here on earth. 
our highest privilege. I like that statement that somebody shared with me from a little book on prayer. It says, it says, God is more interested in our worship than in our service. The heavenly bridegroom is wooing a bride, not hiring a servant. Isn't that nice? God is more interested in our worship, in our love, than in our service. The heavenly bridegroom is wooing a bride, not hiring a servant. And so we offer up the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, the sacrifice of our praise. We offer the sacrifice of our persons to him. Um, once again, not dead bodies, living bodies, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present your body the living sacrifice. And then we offer up the sacrifice of our pocketbooks too, don't we? Um, to do good and communicate, forget not, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And we offer up the sacrifice of our service to the Lord as well. Paul spoke of his ministry among the Gentiles as being a sacrifice to God. And so as holy priests, we offer up these spiritual sacrifices to God. As it says, as uh, a royal priest, we go forth to the world to show forth the excellency of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We believe that. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, a truth that's precious to our hearts. And so there we have it. You have the truth of the one body. Let's stick to it. Let, let's be delivered from sectarianism of any kind and realize the preciousness of the body of Christ. All believers are members of that body. Let's be careful to love all the people of God because they belong to Christ. Doesn't mean you can cooperate with them and everything. Doesn't mean you can do what they do. Doesn't mean you believe all that they believe. But you're united with them in Christ, an indissoluble link. The plurality of elders in the assembly. To the saints, with the bishops and the deacons. Pray for your elders more perhaps than we have been doing. Christ, the gathering center, we go there because he's there. He is the attraction, the object of our affection. The gifts given for the edifying, for the purpose of the saints under the work of the ministry, under the edifying of the body of Christ. The gifts are expendable. The saints are not to become perpetually dependent upon them. Every local church autonomous standing there, Christ in the midst, nothing between to control those local churches. And finally, the priesthood of all believers, holy priests, royal priests, offering up spiritual sacrifices going forth to speak of his excellency to all the world. May the Lord bless these principles to our hearts today.